Seven o'clock, I'll call the meeting of the Board of Selectmen to order. Um, our first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance, and I would recognize the Deputy First Selectman to lead the board. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Madam. All members of the Board of Selectmen are present. Is there any public participation? This is one of two opportunities for the public to address the board. Um, if, if you'd like to speak, kindly identify yourself by your name and address. If you're on the agenda for a later point in the meeting, um, we will get to that as well. Uh, again, there will be another opportunity later in the meeting to address the board. Are there any comments from the public? Any comments from the public? Mr. Leach, kindly identify yourself with your name and your address, please. Bob Leach, 39 Church Street. Um, just curious, I noticed there wasn't any, um, oh, I'm sorry, any nominations for any boards or commissions on tonight's agenda. I know that there are a couple for CIP and CIP is going to be meeting very soon to do allocations and I would like to have those members on the board or on the committee rather, um, just curious. So we were in possession of, uh, uh, prior to today, I was in possession of one who was, from my understanding had been that she was applying for a position on the next CIP, which is seated in July. Um, I'll have my staff uh, reach out to them and determine what their intentions were, but um, our working assumption was that she was applying for the, the next iteration of the board based on the application. Okay, I was just curious because uh, we're down to, I believe, three members at the moment. Remind me who the three are. Is it you, Adam, and Bill Towers? That's correct. Okay. Um, we'll uh, circle back on that and have something um, one way or the other for the, the June 3rd meeting. Great, thanks. Any other comments or questions from members of the public? Seeing none, there will be an opportunity later in the meeting, um, and we invite your comment then. Oh, I skipped the approval of the minutes, my mistake. Um, there are two, pack two items in your packet, uh, the regular meeting minutes from April 15th and the regular me meeting minutes from April or from May 6th. Um, this, is, this was an amended uh, package that went out yesterday. Have members had a chance to review them? Yep. Any, any comments or corrections? Could I have a motion? Selectman Muska will move to approve the Board of Selectmen regular meeting minutes from April 15th, 2021. Is there a second? Marie D'Souza will second that. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion or corrections? Seeing none, Selectman D'Souza? Aye. Selectman Baker? Aye. Selectman Nordell? Sorry, couldn't get my mute on then. Uh, aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. So for the uh, motion passes, minutes are adopted. Um, for those members who are um, keeping themselves on mute but wanna opine just to vote, if you press and hold the space bar, you temporarily unmute yourself until you release it. You know, I've done that. I was doing that quite a bit, but there seemed to be a delay. There was a lot of times I'd press the space bar and I'd start talking and you guys would all tell me I was still muted. But so maybe it's just my PC and or my connection at the time. But uh, if you do that, give it a, a second before you start speaking, probably. Mine doesn't work either, Alan, so. Mm. Uh, no, Alan, we, you're muted right now. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> oh. Mine works fine. Apparently, Charlie and I both have crappy AMD processors or something. Hey, I, I, uh, I'm a fan of AMD and have, have owned a fair amount of stock in them over time. Probably the stock is better than the chip. It all depends on when you buy and sell. <laughs> This is why in-person works best. Um, meeting minutes from May 6th. Uh, uh, these were the addendum to the, uh, or the amendment to the submission. 
If members have had an opportunity to review these, I uh, ask for a motion uh, and a second, and then we'll discuss any corrections that need to be made. Selectman Muska will move to approve the Board of Selectmen regular meeting minutes from May 6th, 2021. Is there a second? Marie D'Souza will second those. Motion has been made and seconded. Um, any discussion or corrections? Seeing none, Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Nordell? Uh, aye. And Selectman Muska? Aye. Minutes are adopted. Um, under communications, I included two that I wanted to make the board aware of. Um, 6A um, is testimony that I submitted to the Government Administration and Elections Committee on behalf of the town, uh, basically putting a, a marker down indicating the town's interest in Solnit North if the um, state were ever conveying the property. Um, I submitted written testimony and provided uh, oral comments as well. Um, this is a rehash of, of a request that's been submitted, I think four times in the past. Um, and I, I keep doing it in the, um, in the event that the state is looking to dispossess the property. Jason, can I just ask you a question in regards to sure. that? Um, sure. If this were to pass, do you know the timeline as to when um, the town would take ownership? So I'll speak in generalities because first of all, I'll tell you that this did not advance out of committee. So this is not going to pass. Um, okay. But generally speaking, the legislature puts together one conveyance bill that incorporates all of the conveyance requests that they deem appropriate to advance. And then they pass that once a year. Um, then I think the process is that those parcels included or those projects included in the conveyance bill um, get referred over to the state properties review board. And there's a, a legal administrative process that happens in the executive branch, um, including things like A2 boundary surveys, site plans. Um, uh, the attorney general's office has a role in um, the, the template uh, deed transference. There, there's a, another process that takes a number of months. I've not, I've not followed one start to finish, but my guess is it's probably in the six to eight month range. Okay. There's a whole was, there's a whole board in DAS that actually is charged with administering that. Okay, I was just thinking down the line because I think we get don't we get somewhat like twelve million dollars for having that in the community here, and I was just thinking no. Okay, do we oh. get something? I, we we get a it, we get a pilot payment for that and all other state uh, properties that are in town, and that in total is something like five hundred and forty eight thousand. Not okay. not anywhere near twelve million. Okay, I just was trying to think. Is, I think. 12 million is what I think they use to operate it. Okay. All right, thank you. Also, Jason, like, do we have a plan for that if it were to happen? Or are we in the process of getting a plan together if that were to happen? Um, we would need to know what we're going to do with the current properties that we have if we're going to move you know, town hall, the senior center, um, the annex, all to that facility. Um, and it also kind of conveyed that possibly the state would be responsible for upkeep, but, or not upkeep, but, um, uh, where did I read it? Something about, you know, changing the, the properties over, um, is that something the state would do or would we be um, on your question? Can you point me to a paragraph you're looking at? No, I can't now. Um, but obviously well, I'll answer, like, I'll answer your general question. And then if you have the specific one, I'm happy to address that as well. Um, in terms of the future use of the property and or uh, other municipal properties, that really would be dependent on the conveyance language that's included in the bill. Um, so it's it's somewhat premature to make a determination what it would be. Um, it might be that the state says it needs to be used for municipal use. It might be that the state says 
It needs to be used for commercial use. It might be that this, the state puts other restrictions on the property about what it can't be used for. So all of that is really cart before the horse. They would need to indicate why they are conveying it to the town. And then we would need to, to meet whatever stipulation is in that language. And typically what happens is if a municipality who's receiving this can't meet the terms that are included in the conveyance bill, then ownership reverts back to the state. So we can't tell them we're taking it for purpose A and then turn around and use it for purpose B. We can, we can tell them we would use it for purpose A and then if we don't use it for purpose A, they get it back. That's typically how it goes. So, and that all is dependent on what the conveyance language is, which is an academic conversation at this point because they've already shown it's not happening this year. Okay, so regardless though, because we don't have the conveyance in front of us, there's no way for us to plan ahead Correct. and decide what would go there, what couldn't go there, and what it would cost us to, to you know, my point is, is like, there's probably a cost to us in revamping certain facilities or making them adequate to serve our needs. Um, I'm, I doubt every building there would serve an exact purpose for what we currently need. And there would be a cost associated with us as far as, you know, changing something so it could accommodate the senior center perfectly um, and the annex. You're talking about a feasibility study. And in order to do that, you need access to the property and you need access to their records, none of which we have. We can't get on there because it's a restricted state facility. We don't have any, um, any evidence as to what the, the ongoing maintenance and operational costs of that are in terms of itemization. We can't tell what the electric bill is, what the water bill is, what the, you know, what the maintenance costs are, what the, we don't even know how old the roof is. You know, I mean, there's there's like a whole litany of things that we couldn't possibly know and therefore couldn't possibly study until until it became a reality. The long and short of it is it isn't a reality. Um, and it's just a marker that we are putting down in the event the state looks to dispossess the property. About 10 years ago, they did that. And this this parcel was on the chopping block. Um, and ultimately, it was a similar facility in Hamden that they chose to close down and convey. Um, but the purpose of the submission in front of the GAE committee was to basically remind folks that if they were in that mindset of, of reducing state properties, we'd take this. Um, they politely said, the, the DCF commissioner testified two people in front of me and she politely said, we're still using it. Um, which I knew, I knew they were going to do, but you put the marker down anyway. Yeah, I read the testimonies and I mean, I was just a little more, it just seemed your letter was a little more forward than, than what you're stating now. Is it just being, showing that we have interest in it? So what I was explaining was the process. What I was just explaining to you all was the process. What my letter was, was actually pointing to an intended use, knowing that the state was going to say, because I actually talked to DCF before I submitted the testimony. Um, they told me they're going to say, we're still using it. I said, okay, I'm still putting the chip down because I'm certainly not going to, we're certainly not going to get it if we don't express an interest. Um, so that's all it was. It's just a marker. I'll, okay. I'll resubmit it again next year. In the future, if they were to actually, you know, pass that out of the, out of the committee and it were to become a law or whatever, I guess, um, and, and so then we'd be offered the property at that time. It's not like we all of a sudden here, you're getting it and you don't have any say in the matter, right? We could then right. do our study and figure out what we want to do and, and say yes or no at that point in time, right? Right, right. They can't, I don't believe they can compel us to take it. We do, right. we do for some sovereignty, sovereignty there. there's like, it's not like a, oh, we're, you know, it's on offer now, take it or leave it. It's, it's on offer now. We have a time to do our feasibility study, decide what, you know, as a town, what we want to do and, and, and go from there and then tell them what, right. I mean, that's typically what would happen. Yeah. It's, it's not a fast process. So the, um, if there's nothing else on that, um, 6B is much better news. Um, so you'll recall that uh, we're trying to resolve the South Road ownership circumstance that um, has disadvantaged the residents there. Um, this bill, uh, Senate or House Bill 1114, 
um, seeks to, re, uh, to lift the low income requirements on property owners on that parcel. And that did pass out of committee. So that's going to be incorporated into the omnibus uh, conveyance bill. Um, that is good news. Um, it didn't pass out unanimously. There were, there were three no votes, but I don't think that that would be sufficient enough to um, preclude it from, from moving forward. So um, it's now on to the House and then to the Senate to see that it is actually uh, included in the conveyance bill, but it looks like that low income restriction is going to be coming off. Um, we should know the answer to that sometime between now and uh, June 9th. Uh, and I think it will be probably that Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday when we'll see that for sure. Um, so that would be the last um, state level hurdle and, and low income restriction hurdle associated with, with dispossessing uh, that property and, and restoring the homeowners rights to the ground their homes sit on. Um, there are some other internal things that we still need to work out. Um, I think I shared with you that we're starting the um, sewer, sewer line improvements that need to be done. Um, there's also some uh, lot line configurations that need to be addressed and, and some outbuildings that need to be, we, we need to sort out ownership there, but um, we're, we're inching closer to a resolution here um, at a pace I'm actually pretty comfortable with. So I'm hoping that we'll have more information on that. Well, I'll have uh, more tangible things for board action, probably the first meeting in July is my guess, uh, as things progress. So that's really good news. I'm, I'm actually, and, and the reception from the leadership of the committee was very supportive. So good stuff. Um, we don't have any uh, resignations, reappointments or new appointments. Uh, and I kind of just shared with you the South Road update, but I'll, ask, I'll answer any questions anybody has about that if there are any. Um, really, we're still in the, the legal process here before we move on to the land use process. Jason, there was, one, Go ahead. Jason there was one homeowner that was having some legal issues regarding the property line with the abutting property. Did you ever um, contact that individual? Uh, no, and I think that was an encroachment thing um, with the, right. the answer is no. Um, I don't. I don't have any new information on that. All right. That's just the first informational form we had back in November. I haven't heard of it as a prevailing uh, uh, prevailing issue, and we use the same. Uh, we use J.R. Russo for the the boundary survey, the same as the the developer okay. did. It's probably been a resolved issue. Okay, I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of it once we move forward. Yeah, Russo did the uh, the company's um, survey and ours, so we're, we're okay there, I think. All right, good. Okay, um, wetlands violations, citations, and procedures ordinance. Uh, Ruth Calabrese is with us. She's the town's uh, zoning enforcement officer, as you know, um, and I'm going to turn this over to Ruth and to Alan, because um, this has been something that Alan has been working on with a passion for quite some time. Um, it's been through the Wetlands Commission and it's been referred and reviewed by Pullman and Comley. Um, there have been some rewrites from Pullman that are incorporated into the packet. There's the clean version and the red line. But Alan, you want to walk us through it? <coughs> uh, I can give you a brief overview of it. Um, so basically, as you guys know, uh, we've been you know, a couple couple times we've tried to get this passed, and basically this is just kind of setting up the same thing that I already have at planning and zoning, where if you have a violation, um, you know, you have a a mechanism to to get compliance from the the, the the violator, you know, before actually just having to go to court or put a lien on their property or something. So, you know, basically there's uh, there's a flow chart that I don't know if we have, but, uh, you know, it, there's a pretty circuitous path that we take to really make sure that the, the person or the violator uh, has, you know, an off ramp on a number of occasions to, you know, to get themselves back in the clients and avoid fees. So these fees are basically the upshot of this is just to uh, be able to charge a fee uh, for a violation that is unaddressed and, uh, you know, you know, we just, you, 
multiple refusals by whoever that, whether it's a company or a resident, um, and, and bring them back into compliance. And it closely mirrors what planning and zoning has already done for years and years. I don't know if Ruth, if you have anything else you would like to add to that. Uh, well, I could share the flow chart. I'm trying to make my way to it, if you'd like to see it. Yeah, so where we're at with it now, while she's doing that is, you know, we've, like Jason says, we, we really hashed it out a, a lot at the planning, at the Wetlands uh, Commission, uh, both for some time before Ruth came and Ruth helped us get it over the line. It's been vetted um, once again by the by the, our lawyers, the town lawyers. So um, when everything is in place, it needs our approval and then to go to town meeting. And and then of course, you know, it'll become an ordinance if it passes. So the, this is the last stop before a town meeting, which we do want to do in person and not on Zoom. Okay, I um, thought I had sent myself a link to the uh, the file that had. You know what? I, uh, I don't. Have it. I apologize. Sorry, that, that. I could have done that myself, actually. But we have a hard copy in our package of the flowchart. Yep. Yeah. We did, we oh, okay. Did. Good. Hold on. So really. Um, as Alan was saying, the flow chart goes through the sequence of, you know, an initial notice of violation and whether or not things get um, corrected. And there's probably three, you know, solid off ramps for opportunities prior to going to citation. And then that goes to a hearing before a citation is actually issued. There you guys see my screen? Yep. Yes. Um, so we'll just kind of cruise through it real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously we send a notice of violation and that's really 90% of like everything we do, especially with residents and even with, and with your better developers, the minute somebody gets that letter, they're calling right into the office and they're saying, Hey, what's going on? I had no idea what, you know, that I was doing something here that, that you know, and it's, and it gets settled. I mean, a lot of times it doesn't even come to the commission um, unless it's, you know, a little bit more complex or, or, or whatever, but uh, so that's the first stop. And, and, and really I got to say over the years that I've been doing this, that's where it ends. It, you know, never, it never really goes. It's just like really 1% of all of our cases that actually ends up going on. So, um, so anyway, if they take care of it, sorry, uh, if they take care of it, uh, you know, it's done. Um, now, the first kind of fork in the road we have is if, if the, the matter is, is uh, urgent, which means like it's really serious, somebody is actually polluting, um, you know, digging into a wetland, uh, you know, silting up or polluting a water course, um, the wetlands can just vote to do a citation right then and there. Um, and then you can see, you know, then you go down that path, which is, uh, you know, right down through uh, uh, the citation. You got 30 days now. If you look at this, you have a lot of time flying by, even on the, you know, it's urgent. Oops, sorry. You know, you have your initial letter, then you have 30 days before you. Um, have a, a, a check, to, did, did you correct it or you want to appeal it, whatever, then you get your fine. So there's, there's quite a bit of time. If, uh, for normal ones, it's the 30 days and then, you know, it, then it heads down that path. So it could be 60 days before, uh, you know, you come to a resolution. So, hi, hon, I'm busy right now. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> so it's really, uh, it's not like, it's not like people are going to get a, a, a fee started all of a sudden, like you're going to get a letter and all of a sudden you're going to get slammed with fees. You're going to get a letter. You're going to have some time uh, to call in and, and get it figured out. If it's not like a huge issue that's, that's got to be resolved, you're going to get another 30 days. So it's two months to kind of work through it before you get to the, the, to the fee schedule. And really, 
that one percent that's what happens right now anyways we get you know we just basically in some cases when oops sorry when when we have a problem we just get ignored just completely ignored we have a current case right now that uh, is a good example of why we need this um so we sent out a violation letter and we're ignored and then we we're kind of you know okay fine i'll come in and then canceled you know and, and we've had that before where you just kind of get jerked around a little bit um and then finally because of the nature of the of the violation we had to go to court and so we immediately we go from uh you know a letter to a court case right which costs everybody money and we, that's what we're trying to avoid with this and um and there's also you know kind of takes some of the manners of us resolving it amicably with the with the violator uh, or the alleged violator um, out of our hands and into the court's hands, which is not good for uh, the alleged violator. So um, this really is a help for the violators. Um, and it also gives us another tool. We don't have to go right to the lawyers and start spending money and that kind of stuff. Now, you know, one might say, well, why do you even bother with that in the first place? If we don't properly uh, police, for lack of a better word, uh, manage our good stewards of our inland wetlands, then it just reverts to deep and they'll do it for us. So everybody's application would have to go through the state. Um, and that's obviously nobody a, hole. a lot of time. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I don't know if anybody's got any questions. I do, Alan. I have two, actually. Um, first one is, has the fee schedule been established? Is that also done? Uh, yes. Do we have that? I didn't know that's that. not included in our packet. <laughs> the yeah. ordinance does speak to the fee schedule being um, amended by the Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Agency from time to time. But we have, a, we have a current one. Yeah, and we have, and we, no, we have a draft proposed. one. Proposed. It's proposed. It would be proposed. Yeah, it's could because it would. If this passes, then that would have to be passed by the inland wetlands agency. But we would definitely share that. And we, I, I don't know. It's not in our, not in our packet. But um, we, I think, we're pretty reasonable, and we tried to again, uh, kind of track what we already have with planning and zoning, and. and Again, we're not trying to like make money off of this. Uh, and let me tell you, the fees that you get when you get a judgment against you at court far surpass this. And that's what we have right now in a current case where somebody got a judgment against them and the fees are, they can rack up really quickly. So this is really a, this is a protection for everybody. I do have that. Oh, I do sorry. have the I do have the fine the proposed fine um, schedule if you want to see it. You want to see that, Charlie? Now or no? No, I just okay. was curious as to whether there was you know one that was current. That's all. Yeah, um, we did work on that because that was a a failure to plan for you know one of the times that we we uh, had brought this to town meeting. Uh, people were concerned that there wasn't a fee schedule. So we have that in hand this time. Okay. And then my second question was about the appointing of the hearing officer. And it states here that the board of selectmen do it um, to serve as a two year term. But I just wondered when is that done? Is that done right after the election of the selectmen or is there a certain term that is already established and ends? And how do we know that term? Like well, when is it coming up? Two so if, if you were to be appointed on May 20th, 2021, you would serve until May 19th, 2023. Um, it's, we, most of our appointments don't have appointment um, target dates, but they're for a term certain. So it would be whenever the selectman went ahead and appointed um, that hearing officer. So we don't currently have one? I think we do. I think it's Bob Slate. That's true. Okay, because I just, I didn't remember doing one and we've almost served two years, so. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if that's a two year term or not, but I can check quickly. But the way the ordinance is now, 
there's no power in his ability to do anything. <clears throat> well, it would, the, the fee schedule, the, the, the ability or the need or the, the decision to actually fine and the decision to modify that fine, like say somebody came up and racked up, uh, you know, $2,500 worth of fines. The Inland Wetlands uh, Commission could vote to decrease that, or th they could devote to say, you know, we've got compliance and there was no harm, no foul, so uh, we're going to zero that out. Um, you know, there's flexibility there um, as far as that's concerned. And the individual who gets the citation can ask for the hearing and the hearing officer can adjust based on evidence presented. You know, of course, the wetlands, and I guess that would be where the wetlands commission would, would say, here's what we think should happen based on, mm -hmm. you know, the impacts and the, the experience that we had trying to get compliance, you know? So uh, the, the idea is that you know, again, we're looking for compliance. If you can get to compliance and you haven't caused damage uh, or a lot of money to be spent, then, you know, I think we could be reasonable. Okay. Charlie, to answer your question, Bob Slate is the citation hearing officer uh, and he, his term expires on February 20th of 2022. We did reappoint him early in our term. Any other questions or comments on this? I just say I, this is this is a good stopgap between our current two options of please do what we want you to and we'll see you in court. And I, I just want to thank Alan and the uh, Inland Wetlands folks for spending a lot of time and putting a lot of thought into this. Um, they they really did really think through. How this is going to work and, and Ruth thank you for your part in this as well. And Ruth has been uh, extremely helpful it came in very timely right when we needed to wrap everything up and make it all professional so uh, excellent job Ruth. Thank you. Um, so if there's no other comments on this um, Alan? I had a question when are we going to have a public town meeting in person so we could pass this thing? <laughs> um, so the executive orders have been extended to June 30th. Well, actually they've been extended beyond that, but the uh, the remote meetings have been extended to June 30th. That was just done two days ago. Um, so this will be in the hopper for a little bit, but you know we'll keep our, our, our uh, commitment to Mr. Pippin to, to make sure we're doing this as a live and in-person um, town meeting. No, and I, and I, I, wanna, I really wanna do it that way too, because um, We've, we've been at this before at town meeting and I, that's how I want to finish it. Yep. Selectman Baker, would you like to make a motion? Uh, I would like to make a motion that the, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my place here. Uh, anyway, I, I'd like to make a motion that the Board of Selectmen uh, approve this, res, this Inland Wetlands Citation Ordinance and pass it to town meeting. Is there a second? Like no, so. second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Motion made by Alan, seconded by Sarah. Any further discussion on the proposed ordinance? Jason, just to make sure that we're in compliance with um, the 14 day, I believe it is for <clears throat> town meeting. Could we put it when appropriate at the end of that motion? <clears throat> Uh, what 14 day? I thought that if you pass something at Board of Selectmen meeting for town meeting, you have 14 days to notice it. I could be wrong, but that's my, was my understanding. No, I, I don't believe that's correct. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure we don't get in any um, time frame constraints. Okay. Any further discussion? Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. 
Blackman Muska. Aye. Ordinance passes unanimously. On to town meeting. Next um, is to include com uh, Community Services Director Melissa Maltesi. Um, Melissa, as you all know, has been working in, you know, on many things, but uh, uh, one of the projects she's been working on is something I'm very excited about, which is the um, uh, implementation of a summer concert series, um, which many, many towns have done for many years and East Windsor um, hasn't. Um, because of Melissa's good work, we're now going to be hosting eight of them this year. Um, there'll be two Thursdays a month um, through June. June, July, and August with a couple of Tuesdays thrown in there. And Melissa can share the specific dates if, uh, if you guys are interested. Um, but one of the things that's come up uh, as a question of interest is whether um, some, some accommodation can be made to allow for um, uh, concert goers to, participate, to bring a bottle of wine or, or you know, some picnic-y stuff to enjoy the, the show. So I'll let Melissa kind of explain what the, the plan is and what her thoughts are, and then we'll open it up for feedback from the board. Melissa? Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, so as Jason said, uh, we are super excited to have our first uh, summer concert, uh, June 10th, right at the park on our new newly constructed band shell. The first band up on our docket this year is gonna be a local Broadbrook band, Steel and Easy. Uh, 6.30 to 8 at East Windsor Park. Um, the full schedule will be released next week. Uh, we had one band, unfortunately, uh, back out, so we are in the process of filling that spot. Um, so we will announce the whole um, lineup uh, next week, hopefully on by Tuesday. Uh, so in regards to this request, uh, we have been getting some calls and in different organizations that are looking to promote the concert series, um, wondering if we allow uh, beer and wine to be had at the park. Uh, right now, the current ordinance states that uh, no alcohol is allowed on town property without Board of Selectmen approval. So we're looking uh, for the board's approval to either create a policy or um, gain approval to host um, this at East Windsor Park for just the summer concert series. Um, we're asking for it to be an exception during the, that, um, those events um, to be um, done responsibly and uh, with the guidance of the First Selectman's Office and the Police Department. So in terms of talking about this, uh, I'll be honest, I've been an elected official here for 14 years now and I always thought that there was an absolute cold prohibition on uh, alcoholic beverages on town property, like bar none without exception. And so we talked about, you know, different ways we could redraft the ordinance so that, you know, there could be some reasonable accommodation under very specific circumstances. And then uh, upon reading the ordinance that's been in place for 30 years, you don't need to. The, the exception has been there literally the entire time. So um, Melissa has talked to uh, the chief of police, um, and when Clark was here, we, we worked with him as well um, to figure out what exactly we would need to do. Um, and there have been some recommendations uh, that have been provided back. The thought, the general thought is to, pr to provide an application form with specific guidelines that can be brought to the board for approval. Um, so, so conceptually, it would be things like, um, how many people are, are going to attend? What is the nature of the event? Has it been has it been authorized by the chief of police, by the fire marshal, by the uh, planner, um, to make sure that we're thinking about those things that we need to, to, to do? Um, what type of alcohol, what type of event, who's the sponsoring organization? Just things like that to make sure that we have our, our ducks in a row. Um, but we think this could be a nice way of, of enhancing a really positive community experience in a reasonable and, and controlled way. So what are your what are your thoughts on that as a concept? Sarah. Blackman Muska, Jason, when you say application, do you mean the party that would like to bring the alcoholic beverage to the event would need to fill that out? Is that the hosting party? The, the hosting organization. So okay. in this case, Melissa as Parks and Recreation would be the applicant. Just like if you were okay. doing a special permit for um, like the Hal Kresge thing that's at Joe's uh, package store. 
Um, not everybody who goes to that fills out an application, but the host organization does and assumes some liability. Okay. So we I mean, have a model, sorry. We no, have a model ahead. with uh, Cromwell. Uh, they do an exep exception uh, for alcoholic beverages application process with the Cromwell Police Department. So uh, we'd like to model it after them where they have to put the agency asking permission. As Jason said, how many people are expected? Um, what would be permitted? Um, and the length of time that it would be permitted for. Okay, that answers my questions. Thank you. Other questions or comment? Any feedback? I just think it's going to be beneficial. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of concerns over the years that when those, <coughs> excuse me, when those type of activities come up that you can't bring it. I think it just certainly will enhance people coming forward to attend some of those things. And it's only for an hour and a half. Um, so I don't think there's going to be any real strong liability for somebody to sit down and listen and have a little snack and take a little drink. Um, so I, I think it's a good idea moving forward. Yeah, I think it also takes some of the pressure off of my staff as well to have to not walk around constantly telling people to put it away. Um, that's right. currently what we have to do specifically on July 4th. Um, we have a lot of trouble with that. Yeah. Um, so just being able to uh, have our staff there if needed um, and just reminding people to be responsible is what our goal is. Yeah, and, and what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna be encouraging a 19 year old who, who's a, a summer staffer to be you know, having to police adults who are supposed to be acting like adults. Um, you know, that, that's not what we want to, that's not a circumstance we want to invite, but we want to provide reasonable controls so that, you know, there, there's some flexibility around the, the, the process. Sarah, you had your hand up. Just for clarification, this is just during the summer concert series, correct? Not during regular park hours. Right. Okay, thanks. The general practice could be, though, that um, if there was an organization, and, and Captain LeMay is going to uh, speak to this next, but if there was an organization who was doing a private event, um, they'd have to meet that same set of criteria and that same set of, of, you know, whatever requirements are going to be on that form, and they may be denied. You know, if it becomes something that, that looks like a circumstance we don't want to have get out of hand, then we, we as the authority could shut it down, could say, no, you know, we're not going to approve this. And, and that's left by the ordinance to this board's uh, best judgment to make that determination. So in Melissa's case, she's doing eight events. We wouldn't make her fill out eight applications. We'd make her fill out one application for the series, um, recognizing that it's the same event by the same sponsoring organization. You know, that, that seems to make some sense. Um, but, you know, my neighbors and I want to go down to the to the res on Saturday, I'm going to fill out a form. Uh, you, you guys ought to shut that down. You know, there's a degree of reasonableness that needs to be applied here. Uh, I, and I think I think the five of us get it. Other questions or comments? It's like my Nordell. I think it's a great idea. Um, I just strongly think there should be time restraints on it, like, you know, after six and not past 10 or something along those lines. So that's a, that's a very reasonable suggestion. In the past, we've had um, this discussion about, uh, I think specifically, Melissa, the, the issue uh, you were having with keeping people, your, your, your 19 year olds keeping 30 or 40 or 50 year olds from drinking. I'm, I'm just a little concerned. Uh, I don't know if I'd call it a concern, but I, I, I wonder how we envision handling the 53-year-old uh, that's been drinking all afternoon and then shows up and is obnoxious and is drinking. Like, uh, I mean, have you had that happen already in the past anyway? How do you handle that? And, you know, in, you know, in this case, you know, some people, you know, are just like that. They, they're going to get partying and get it going and then just get really out of hand when they get to where they're going. How do you handle that? Sure. So we've had a couple isolated incidents where people have come to the park intoxicated. Um, we observe them uh, for a little bit. And if we feel that it's an unsafe practice, then we call um, the police department for assistance and 
it's it's been an, a working environment that's been fine. Um, they usually have people in our district anyway stationed on that side of town, so um, the response time is always uh, is always good. Um, we we've not had an issue. Um, and there are still pu public drunkenness standards that you know you, you can't be blitzed just because. Um, you know, there's you can still be in excess even if you're not consuming in public, and and there are laws that protect that. Yeah, no, I'm, I think this is a fantastic idea. I just wanted to make sure that we were, you know, the staff is safe, other people are safe, and, you know, and, and it sounds like, uh, as I suspected, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they know when it's going on, and they might even be sitting in the parking lot for part of the time. So um, we, I just want we to make sure that process. we... We have a process with our staff that um, they are not to approach if it's an unsafe um, environment. So um, again, that's where the observation factor comes in, and getting the name of the, the person or the license plate make model of the car. Um, we've had to do that in the past. So we have a little bit of practice in that. Okay, so you have the problem whether you're allowing drinking there or not, which is obvious, like I'm sure in the case, but yeah, I just want to make sure we did have a process and it sounds like you did. Yep. And as part of the, you know, I'm, I'm brainstorming, but as part of the potential sign off from the chief of police based on the applicant, the chief could recommend whether or not there needed to be an officer on site or not. Um, you know, I mean, if it's, event, if it's, yeah. you know, the summer concert series, which I expect will be a relatively tame set of circumstances, he might say probably not necessary on a Thursday night. Um, if you're going to be doing, uh, you know, my high school reunion, he, he might just say, you know what, things could get a little out of control. That class of 2000 was, was a mess anyway let's make sure there's a police officer on, on hand, you know, that it, we could incorporate his, his best judgment into his approval process. I like that. Class 2000 was rowdy, man. I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions or comments on the, the general concept of this? So what, what we'll do, um, and, and we've started the process of, of kind of staffing out what this should look like. Um, with the board's acquiescence, we'll, um, we'll go ahead and, and see if we can get a draft of a form for you um, by our next meeting. Um, I might even, I'll circulate that as early as we can with the hope that we can approve it for the next meeting. Um, and that way, Melissa could uh, meet her June 10th inaugural summer concert event, because uh, we, we don't want to, we don't want to belay that. Unless you guys want to go ahead and authorize her to do it now, um, recognizing that she operates under the town and bears some responsibility for that going off well. Anybody want to authorize Melissa now? I personally would like to see the draft um, before that's done. Anybody else? I'm comfortable now, but I mean, it's, uh, I don't want to, I want to, you know, lose that vote. <laughs> I'm fine with that too, since we only have a couple of weeks. And she's Sorry. marrying up. Um, if the if the chief of police is going to overlook it as well. I'm a fine. I'm fine with approving it now and just send it to us as soon as it's drafted. But if he's going to be looking it over to approve it, I'm, I'm okay with that. Melissa, uh, do we have the luxury of time here to come back with a form in, in two weeks, or should we uh, move forward this evening? I think we're okay with waiting. Okay, then. Um, to Sarah's point, rather rather safe than sorry here, and, and I appreciate the the sentiment from board members voicing their their confidence in her. But if we have the, the luxury of time, we should use it. Um, so we'll get a draft circulated as quickly as we can. Um, and if you have any uh, feedback, just let us know, and we'll we'll try and incorporate that for a final approval on the third. Okay. So with, with that as the general premise for how we, we may move forward with this, uh, we kind of have another applicant. 
and I'd uh, invite Captain LeMay to explain what his thought process is and, and what they're planning um, now that he's had the benefit of listening to our conversation. Captain LeMay? Good evening. Uh, thank Good you evening. for having me tonight. Appreciate it. Um, I come to you tonight to explain what's going on. Um, as most of you have read in the patch or heard around town, it is the Broadway Fire Department's 125th anniversary this year. With that being said, we're going to have uh, an event. We're going to hold it at the East Windsor Reservoir. It's going to include food trucks, bounce houses, you know, stuff like that. Um, we're also going to have a parade, a fireman's parade, which is going to come down Main Street like it did for many, many years in this town until not too long ago, we had to stop doing it for unforeseen reasons. Um, that will take place, it will lead from the East Windsor Middle School and it will parade to the East Windsor Park. And after the festivities at the park, we're planning on having a fireworks display um, in town that evening at 9 p.m. at that night on August 21st is the date. Uh, and the parade is going to kick off at 5 and end at the park, hopefully around 6, 6.30 depending on the amount of people we get. Uh, the reason I come to you tonight is um, in the past, uh, firemen have been known to have a few beers here and there. <laughs> and uh, we're looking, backing up what Melissa said, to back up to what Melissa said, um, looking to have a fireman's beer garden at the East Windsor Reservoir for that festivity. And that's going to be for parade participants only. That's going to be in a controlled environment. It's going to be gated. Nobody will be allowed in there unless you're over the age of 21. And we're just looking for the permission from the Board of Selectmen to move forward with it, uh, to be, make it part of our festivities. As now, I can also fill out an application and I have plenty of time to submit it, but I would like to see what your thoughts are in order to move forward. So, Captain, first of all, congratulations to you and your organization on that impressive milestone. A um, lot, of, lot of service to the community. So thank you for that. Um, I, I, you know, it, it was your, the uh, notion of your event that actually started this conversation um, with Melissa and I and, and others at the staff level. Um, so I think that, you know, certainly it seems like a reasonable request. And, and it, once we develop that framework, um, given that you have enough time to, to complete whatever the board will require, it seems like um, a good tip of the hat to a longstanding tradition. Other comments, uh, feedback from members of the board? Charlie. Um, so just for clarification, um, you guys are going to only allow parade participants. Now, are you going to be selling beer to them or you're just free handing beer to them. We're uh, handing it out, it's free of charge. We're not selling anything at all. Okay. So Charlie, you raise a good question uh, and it's a distinction between the ordinance and our zoning regulation. You cannot under, uh, under our zoning regulations sell alcohol um, in, in that particular zone or on town property. Um, you can, and it's because of the zone I think, and Ruth can correct me if I'm wrong, but the zoning of where the park is prohibits the sale of alcohol. Um, so even, even if you were to approve, uh, get approval from the board for the consumption, you can't sell it. Um, and that's, that's a distinction that's different in the ordinance than it is in the regulation. Um, so that's a good point to, to clarify. And I swear, I thought you were going to ask when you, when you asked about the parade participants, I thought you were going to ask if we'd be invited to march in the parade. <laughs> One yes. parade that thought had crossed my mind. However, that wasn't my main concern. Um, no, because I think we even also, I mean, even if it was allowed with sales of alcohol, then I think you need a state permit as well. So um, that was my other concern if they were selling. So that, that is correct. You would need a, you would need a uh, license in order to sell that, but you'd have to apply for a day license. And we're not in the market to do that, nor do we want that kind of responsibility. Okay. The zoning regulations prevent the sale of alcohol in an R3 zone, which happens to be where the park is. So I'm curious, uh, you know, 
I was, as you know, at Warehouse Point for 10 years and I, I used to run the carnival there. I never ran the beer garden. So I'm not, I don't remember how that worked. Was there any other, you know, thing, hoops you had to jump through uh, as far as, um, you know, I think our guys were certified, you know, in ID checking or something, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, do you have to do other stuff like that to just, you know, make sure that, um, you know, the other rules besides just, you know, our approval of having beer are, are dealt with? I think, I think, and I'm just going out on a limb here that Warehouse Point, because they sold beer at their beer gardens and because it was on their property, they probably had to have their people get certified to check IDs to do that. Yeah. But because we're not selling it, and we've always been like that, we've always given it away at the end of the parade, it's always been controlled, it's always been watched. We've even had police officers in the beer gardens at times watching everything or even at the gate, which if that's what we have to do, we will do. But to answer your question, I don't know if I have to have anybody certified. I don't believe so because we've never ran into that because we didn't sell it before. Yeah. I'm just curious. Sure. And the warehouse point fairgrounds are in a different um, zone anyway. They're in a they're in a B one zone. Now it's a building. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's almost a building. It's got to have four sides, I think. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for Captain LeMay? Sarah. Just a comment. Um, I just want to say congratulations and I'm looking forward to this event. I think it's something for the community to really look forward to. We've been so stuck inside fun. for so long and it'll be nice to have to celebrate something um, so great. So congratulations. Thank you very much. It'll also be great for you guys to have a parade again back on that side of town. It's been way too long. We're, we're looking forward to it. And, you know, if it takes off again, who knows? We might do it again next year. We don't know. We'll see what our guys think. We're trying to make it to where we don't have to do a ton of work, where that's where it was for the carnival for to put it on for three days. You know, it was just a lot, a lot of work. Just didn't have the manpower anymore to do it. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, we got big plans. So stay tuned. August 21st. It's going to be great. Congrats, man. Thank you. Uh, so the next item on our agenda includes George Krivda, our uh, grant program consultant. Um, we are we're making good progress in terms of having uh, our, our small business and nonprofit assistance grant through the ARP um, available. Uh, so I'm going to ask, yeah, Vinny? No, I was just saying good night. Oh, have a good one. Thanks very much. Thank you. So I'm going to ask George to kind of give us an update on where things stand and talk to us a bit about next steps. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to work with you on this program, which I think is going to be very beneficial to the town. Uh, as I understand, you've received both the document that explains the program and the application form. I think it's relatively self-explanatory and I'd be delighted to take any questions you may have on either document. Beyond that, once this gets approved, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what you folks need to do to, to accept this. But beyond that, we're gonna do everything we can to move forward with uh, advancing it forward to the businesses and the nonprofits in the town. There are a variety of ways to reach out. And uh, I would let, you know, it goes on the town website, et cetera but I, I would defer to the first selectman on the specifics about how it will be distributed. But if there are any questions, I'd be glad to take them right now. 
Has everybody had a chance to uh, review the attachments included in your packet? Questions or comments for George? Marie? Yeah, um, on the small businesses, um, you've indicated they have to register to conduct business for 12, 12 months. What about the new business in town that opened up just at the onset of everything closing down um, and lost revenue that was anticipated, um, kept the business open? Um, would they fall under that even though they didn't weren't able to have, and I'm looking at the bake shop in uh, Bastille Plaza, um, where she opened up and then everything closed up and her potential revenue moving forward was lost. Um, someone like that individual, would they qualify the way this is written? Well, you know, unfortunately, there are going to be a lot of tough questions. I mean, you know, we have here 12 months, but suppose someone started 11 months and, you know, 15 days and are valuable to the community. Um, those are our questions I think we're going to look at. I think there's going to be an evaluation once we get the complete scope of what the applicants are. And I would advocate for a lenient policy, but you know, those are gonna to be tough questions. Where do you draw the line? Is it, is it 11 months and 29 days? Where, where do you fall on that? And I think I would defer any hard answer to whether someone like that would qualify until I have an opportunity to evaluate the entire scope of the applicants. And we have a, a limited amount of money and, you know, other folks are gonna weigh in on this. So I'm gonna hope for a happy resolution to all of these questions. I think the, uh, the point that we're trying to, to get to with that is to, to have some determination so that a loss can be quantified. Um, you know, you need to be able to demonstrate a loss in order for, for um, you, you need to be able to demonstrate a loss due to the right. pandemic. Um, now, the, there's also going to be um, conditions that are imposed by the federal government in the, the interim final rules that are put, or the final rules rather that are put out um, pertaining to the ARP. So what we're trying to be able to, to, to meet is that whatever expense we're trying to recognize is pandemic driven. Um, so, you, you know, using the, the example of a bakery who opened in January of 2020 and then closed down and maybe reopened or maybe didn't, you can't really, you, you don't really have a benchmark to know that it was the pandemic that would have kept them out of business, you know? So we're trying to, to make that determination as to an established business that had a, demonst a demonstrable impact from the pandemic. Maybe 12 months isn't the number, but that's like the, the concept that we're trying to get to is, did the pandemic cause that disruption in, in revenue and that disruption in your business? How do you demonstrate that? Um, if it's not 12 months, maybe it's six months. If it's, uh, you know, it, but to George's point, at some point, somebody is gonna be on either side of that line. Right. Okay. So, because you raised it, is 12 months the right line? You know, I mean, we can we can have that discussion here and see if we can't work out something that, that we're all comfortable with. Do you want to leave enough uh, flexibility and, and uh, gray area in there so that that determination is made at the point of review? I'd rather have it be established at the outset, but, you know, I leave that to the board for you guys to provide some, some insight on. It's like my Nordell here. Yeah, because to your point, Jason, I mean, you almost really need like 24 months to establish what they did in a normal year versus what they did in a COVID year to establish their true loss. Because um, in reality, if they started 12 months ago, COVID was already here. So how do you prove any loss at all with that short time period? 
I think that's what that's intending to do. No. No. <laughs> yeah. No, that is what it was intended to do, but that's not what it says. You're right. So in so we, reality, it needs to stay. To, we could do 12 months prior to the outset of the pandemic, which is what I thought I was supposed to say. Um, or we could also take, a, a, to George's point, a little bit of a more liberal approach, which is to say um, some demonstration that uh, an executive order or the, pan, or the pandemic itself had an adverse effect on the, the business. So, if, for example, if you were a, a hair salon, you know, a barbershop, they were ordered to close for 12 or 14 weeks or whatever it was. Um, you know, there, if, if you can point to an order that had an adverse effect on the business, you can reasonably assume that that had an adverse effect on the business. Um, you know, that, that that executive order, I mean, did. So maybe that's a, a way to angle it. I don't know, I'm, I'm brainstorming. I, I was also thinking that we could maybe say, you know, we, we have that timeline and then put a caveat that, uh, you know, if funds allow, we would entertain, you know, a shorter timeline, you know, as long as a demonstrated need is, is apparent, you know, just to give us that ability to re review, to review. Okay. So, you know, say we only get, we don't have enough people to, to use the money. And we do have a few of these edge cases that, that, you know, other than, you know, the 12 months they would have qualified, you know, we, you know, that gives us the, the ability to, you know, to re-review them on a second tranche or something, you know? That's actually, a, a, that's a good compromise. Sarah. Like Mimuska, yeah, I agree with what Alan said. Um, and I do agree with changing the verbiage to 12 months prior to the pandemic, but I can see Marie's point. There are a few businesses here that, just happened to, to open up shop right as this hit and, and they invested a lot of money and unfortunately didn't get the revenue. So I think there will be some exceptions and I think that um, we should give them an opportunity as well, as long as it's you know allowed as far as if we don't have too many applicants for the money we have. But I think they should, um, we should have that option on there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not personally aware of any East Windsor businesses, but living close to the South Windsor line, I had that way quite a bit. And I remember just as we were shutting down, Joe's Pizza was ready to open up and they didn't open. And I was thinking, wow, that guy sunk a lot of, lot of dough into revamping that place. He's got a payment to make. And now what? You know, well, he's got the PPP and stuff like that. But, you know, this is above and beyond that. And, and I, I think, he, you know, somebody like that should, should be possibly able to access this. So I'll, I'll provide you with a, an in-town example of somebody who is in that circumstance. Um, Soto Optical in Pasco's Common opened in uh, January of 2020 uh, and then were forced to close down for four months, ultimately relocated to a different suite in Pasco's Common and then reopened um, just six or eight weeks ago, I think. Um, so they... Um, they certainly had an impact because of the pandemic. They also certainly were not here 12 months prior to the outset of the pandemic. Um, and I'm sure could use, could use the help. Um, the, the question that, that I think is not gonna be resolved in this conversation is what does the law require? Um, you know, I mean, and, and ultimately that's gonna be the, the rubber match here is, is, you know, what are the restrictions that are put in place by the federal law? But I think certainly the, the sentiment being that, and this is to George's initial point, we wanna be as, as uh, accommodating to applicants as we can be to make sure that we're addressing a need imposed by the circumstances that makes the funding available. Is that the if, general sentiment? It, may, may I, Mr. First yeah. Electman? So my thinking was the 12 month time frame was to establish that they were an actual entity in the town of East Windsor, not 
a thought, a dream, something that folks wanted to do, but were prevented. So once you start drawing parameters on need, you start getting into those sticky questions. So the 12 months was meant to provide some sort of a measurement, a metric on the actual entity that it was there and not something other than that. They were legit. And one of the last points was that they would need to provide tax records from 2019 and 2020 and must demonstrate an economic loss due to the pandemic. So I think you have... And then, of course, it's always subject to the first selectman and the board's uh, overall approval. So there's a lot of room, I think, in this document to take into account legitimate need. And there will be hard decisions that have to be made. I don't want to sugarcoat that, that there's enough to give everybody what everybody wants. That's not likely to be the case. So there's going to be some tough decisions. There are going to need to be some, some parameters. I think the parameters are sufficiently flexible that within, again, the federal rules uh, that we could do what's appropriate and what's going to be very transparent and, you know, there'll, there'll be some tussling at the edges, I'm sure. But, you know, anytime you try to do anything, there's always going to be some issues involved. The only time everything is, is, is everybody's wonderful is when nothing's happening. So, you know, I think we just need to move forward and do it with, I think everyone has the right intentions. And I think I don't, well, I'll leave it at that. I, I, would, I would say that I think the document covers all the concerns that have been raised. But I have no pride of authorship, so feel free to amend it as you wish. No, I just asked a question for clarification. I don't have any um, feelings one way or the other as to who benefits from the program. I just want to make sure that if we're going to have a program out there, those that they had a true loss are going to be benefited. Um, that was the only po point I was making. And I just threw that name out because it's the only one that I knew that was relatively new and um, don't even know if that person's even going to be interested or anything. Um, but it was just an example thrown out there. So I don't have anything invested one way or the other. But I want to be able to explain it if somebody should ask. That's oh, all. of course. Other um, points of discussion on on the um, what is this the guidance document the eligibility criteria? Everything else looks okay. Yeah. Alan, you good? Yes, I am. Charlie, you're good. I saw Sarah and Marie respond. So how about on the, um, the application form? Pretty straightforward. Yeah. I think it asks all the necessary, for all the necessary information. I think it's fine. The planning department is uh, converting this or, or developing this as a fillable printable form um, yeah. so that it'll be, Actually, Amanda got pretty creative about it. Um, hey, Ruth, I'm giving credit where I think credit's due, but correct me otherwise. Um, so you'll remember the, the uh, beta tool that we developed for the commercial real estate listings. She's gonna adapt something similar to this so that when somebody fills out the application electronically, it uh, automatically populates an email to um, a designated email address. So the application goes right to where it needs to go to. 
Um, so it's it's uh, basically a one one stop shop for applicants, um, and we can accept paper copies as well. You know, depending on the the business or the applicant, and the um, you know somebody may not be quite as tech savvy as others. Yeah, and Jason, you probably haven't seen it yet, but Amanda did email you both of those, the PDF version and the link to the website. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, if you want, I can pop it up on my screen. Yep, you should be able um, to share. Yeah, she sent it at 6.59. So good turnaround time. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Just say as a longtime IT professional, Make sure you test the living crap out of that from both inside <laughs> the organization and from outside the organization as well. Can you see the screen? Yep. All right. So then she has added the. Look at that. Nice. And so this information will end up, you can download to an Excel spreadsheet right from here. It'll tally that all up. And she also. Um, if it's the snoop, let me do this. I'm sorry. It has the PDF version as well. That's a fillable form. So there you have it. Great. Good. Yeah, to, to Alan's point, let's kick the tires pretty hard on that. Um, but that that does good. So, Jason. Yeah. One thing that might want to not to throw a monkey wrench in it now that it's all done, but one thing that might want to get added to the to it is contact name, because you have full name of business, but not the name of the contact at the business. Very good point. Yeah. You want to make sure you're talking to the right person. Very good point. That's why we do this collaboratively. <laughs> and we could use you as a UI uh, analyst at the bank. <laughs> no, you couldn't. <laughs> I'm just proud I know what you just said. I don't. <laughs> User interface. Ah. <laughs> what? Other other feedback. So so our suggested timeline was to have this ready to go live for June first, um, and then have uh, an open or be soliciting applications through July first. Um, does that sound like a reasonable time frame? I think so. Now, George, uh, being the, the former federal uh, official that he is, would point out that the only real sticking point is making sure the feds get us the money. <laughs> um, so they're supposed to have it to us by June 15th, according to the federal law. Um, so... <laughs> Fingers crossed. We could we could delay it until the the cash is actually in hand, um, but that's going to slow things down in terms of actually getting relief out to people. Can you put that in the little fine print? <laughs> You'll get the money when the money's here. Contingent upon appropriate funding being provided by the federal government. There you go. I would write the document mm -hmm. actually you know we i was half joking but that's actually not a bad idea yeah, that's a good yeah. one. And actually, that makes me think of another thing too is you know once we we um somebody submits this what do they get back from us do they get a hey great we're going to get back to you in 12 days or hey, you know we got to give them some sort of expectation um so they submit that and then they should get an email back or something, or maybe even something on the screen uh, saying, you know, we got your application on such and such date at such and such time. And, uh, you know, we're not going to do anything if we don't get the money and blah, 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 you know, anything that we think might be important to let them know. And we'll 
check back in with you or if you have further questions, you know, call so-and-so. One of the things that, um, one of the other, that, you know, you're right. Uh, we also should probably have a, a terms and conditions acknowledgements. Um, so I'd like to set up a conversation for George and I with uh, Pullman just to review what the specific requirements within the law is and to help uh, to uh, enlist them to help us generate the legal legalese of that. Um, so we can have that ready for you. I don't want to commit for them, but uh, with a target date of the June 3rd meeting. Um, you know, we'll try and get that as quickly as possible. You guys are filling up my week next week. Like, you, it's like nobody's business. <laughs> um, but does that sound reasonable? You know, so so George and I will talk with the, with the attorneys to, to make sure that we have the T's crossed and I's dotted that we need to have in order to move forward. Yep. Sounds good. Yes. So, you know, George has been coordinating this, but I also want to recognize that there, there are a lot of town staff that have put their, their eyes and their thoughts into this. Um, and, and I'm going to, at the risk of naming names, I'm going to get, I'm going to omit somebody, but um, it's been Ruth, Clark, George, me, Helen, Patty, Joe, Len. And if anybody, if I missed anybody, let me Amy? know. Did you say Amy? Amy, Amy O'Toole. Yep. Um, so it's been, we're trying to do this in a, a casting a very broad net to get the perspectives of, of the expertise that we have here to put forward a high quality product. Um, so this is a, really a, a team effort, you know, on a day-to-day -day level. Any other questions or comments for George? I would just like to say that I'm looking forward to the end of Zoom meetings so <laughs> that I can share with everyone what we're thinking, looking at everyone eye to eye and being able to shake your hand and, and you know, work on the project in a little closer fashion than, than this. This is a, a, a very adequate tool, but, but it, it misses the, the, the small town spirit of what we're trying to accomplish. So I'm looking forward to, to meeting you all and, and looking you all right in the eye when we do this. Sounds good. To a great start. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, George. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Um, in the interest of Ruth's time, um, I'd like to take agenda item 9E up and then come back to 9D, um, is, just because we're tying up her evening. Um, could I have a motion to take 9E out of order? Like we must do. will move to take 9E out of order. Sorry, Murray. That's all right. Is there a second? Marie will second it. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, uh, Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Blackman Baker? Aye. Blackman Nordell? Aye. Blackman Muska? Aye. All right. Um, so this is another project that uh, has come out of the planning department and it's had um, some uh, good feedback from both Clark and from Ruth. Um, it's been a longstanding objective of the Conservation Commission um, to allow for a, an open space uh, assessment um, adjustment. Um, there are models that have been used in other towns. I think this is most closely fashioned after the town of Ellington. Um, and there are, I gotta find my right attachment here. Um, there are a couple of points that, that kind of bring it, that I wanna point out. Uh, in the qualification criteria, um, the applicants would have to be in one of those zones that are identified, which is R1, R2, R3, a1 and A2. Um, there had been discussion at one point, and I can't remember if it was at the Planning and Zoning Commission or the Conservation Commission, about it incorporating all zones in town. And the, the accommodation was that it would be limited to those that are either residential or agricultural. Um, yeah, Ruth, do you remember where that was? That was the desire of the Conservation Commission. And when uh, they sought comment from Planning and Zoning, Planning and Zoning, um, they 
their preference was to have it as listed. Okay. Um, and then another point of, of uh, discussion was in uh, section 4A, which is the acreage. Um, the acreage in the draft in front of you was set at four acres in excess of the basically the buildable lot. Um, that number has fluctuated a little bit. Sometimes it's a, a percentage of the total building lot. Sometimes it's more than four. Sometimes it's a little bit less than four. But um, my recollection from the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, and either Alan or Ruth can correct me, but uh, that four was the reasoned number. Uh, or did they want something higher than that and conservation wanted to stick at four? R remind me of how that went. Because this is now going back to March. So my understanding of it, uh, third person, <laughs> was that um, Planning and Zoning Commission wanted a higher number. Um, and so... The Conservation Commission was pitching the four acres, and that's they they stayed with that. Alan, is it I, that sounds right to me? But is that your recollection too? That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. I, other than that, other than those two things, the the eligible zoning and the acreage requirement, I think this is all pretty self-explanatory. Um, so, have have. Board members had a chance to review it. Do, they, do you have any questions or comments? Um, are we ready for a motion this evening, or do you want to um, do you want to kind of digest this for a couple of weeks and then take it up again? Where, where are you guys? Selectman Nordell has just one question. Do, do you need to reapply each year, or once you've applied, as long as the land use doesn't change, you're still applied. So if you'll note the redlined version in section what is this, 5E, um, there's a note from Pullman and Comley saying exactly that, that we may want to include some sort of a, um, she refers to it as a temporal qualifier. So some renewal period that has to happen every so often, whether it's annually or biannually or you know, what have you. Um, that's not currently in the draft, but we could. Charlie brings up a good point, and I think with the 490, there's a there's a renewal. Yeah, you you know you're out and it reverts. So I think I think we should have one, and I think it should be longer than a year because I mean this is a long term. It does it do this? It's intended to be a long term thing, right? For it to be effective, right? So to me, I think it should be longer than a year. Triennially. Quadrennially, every five years. The only issue I have with, I mean, not that I'm opposed to it, but giving a long extension of time is how would landowners be notified or would they not be notified? Say it's 10 years, would they be notified that, hey, your application is almost up? you need to reapply this year, would that be done by the town, that effort? Or would they have to remember that, hey, my five years is up, I got to reapply for that? Um, One thing we could do is we could tie it to a benchmark that, that people should know. You know, I mean, uh, we have to do a reval every five years. So we could tie it to the reval. The other thing we could do is tie it to a 490. Um, I mean, it's basically a 490 program. It, it's just the optional provision of PA 490. So um, we could tie it to the PA 490 renewals, which actually I think is annually. Yeah, I mean, if, and really, yeah, the devil is in details. As much as I would like it to be longer because, you know, the idea is this is a long-term thing that you want to do, not just I'm going to do this this year and then I'm going to build a giant garage on it next year or whatever. Um, <laughs> You know, so, um, but the devil is in the details, right? Like uh, to Charlie's point, like how do you, you know, you put the onus on the town to send a reminder, or you have the person, you know, the onus on the person to have a reminder. And and I think with 490, I'm rusty, but 490, it's on the person, right, to remember. So yeah, but it's also pretty commonly known that I think it's in the month of May that they need to come and submit their their um, renewal. So it's pretty common that they'll know. Okay, 
I got to get it into between, you know, May 1st and May 31st. If that's effectively when it is, I think it's May. Um, so, I mean, there's, that's, people are used to that. Yeah, yeah that's probably the way to go then. Have you had okay. any feedback from Helen on the comments made here on the time frame? Because it's um, it says she'll she's going to do it. <laughs> yeah, um, so. I don't know that she's seen the the edits from Pullman, but okay. she did. She and Clark did work closely on the initial draft. Um, so because you know there's a couple of edits that we're going to make to this, it doesn't sound like we're going to act on this tonight. So we can run it past her uh, and get mm -hmm. her feedback, but. Um, are we in general agreement that it should be run concurrent with the PA 490 renewals? I would agree with that. I'm fine with that as well. For application, you mean? Yeah, reapplication. Because currently it's September 1st to October 31st in here. Yeah, that and that may be what I, I my recollection is that 490 is a May application, but. Um, now that we're sitting here in May and there hasn't been a parade of farmers going by, I might be remembering that wrong. Um, so it's a point I'll check with Helen. I remember last year, there was a bunch of people who were coming through looking for the assessor. I just thought it was, while well, we weren't here and, and most staff weren't here during the month of May. I'll check with her. Anything else on this? Okay, Ruth, thank you very much for hanging in there with us tonight. Sure. I certainly appreciate your time. You're welcome. Have a good day. So now we're turning to the call of the agenda. Um, we'll take up the demolition delay ordinance. Um, so I have some, some sad news to share with you all first, and if you hadn't heard already, and that's kind of one of the things that leads to the uh, suggestion that we revisit this. Um, I don't know if you've all heard or not, but Barbara Smeagol passed away. Um, she'd been sick for quite some time and she succumbed um, about a week ago. Um, so that's certainly some, some sad news. And she was a very, very passionate and dedicated person. And um, I'd share that with you all. Um, Unrelated to that, um, there are some developments that are going on in town um, that you're all familiar with, whether it's gravel pit solar or the, the Silverman uh, development over on Route 5. Um, and they all have uh, run into some bureaucratic delays on our part um, around uh, historic barns. And there's an ordinance, it's ordinance 03-3, the demolition delay ordinance that um, precludes um, those projects from being able to move forward in a reasonable time period um, without consultation with the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, and there's a couple of problems with that. First, the Historic Preservation Commission does not have a quorum, uh, so they actually can't meet and, and opine on these things in a timely fashion, which necessitates a 90-day delay for any of these projects automatically. Um, so that's a, a concern in terms of the you know, a business friendly approach to um, uh, town operations. The second problem is that it vests a lot of power in an advisory board. The historical commission is advisory to the selectmen and the selectmen are the policy makers. Um, so it's probably in, in, inappropriately vested in them to begin with. So I took a look at the ordinance and ran it past Pullman with some suggested edits um, that basically say, Referrals for de demolition delays for historic structures would come to this board, our board, the policy making board, um, for review, um, and that we may extend the period of time for additional referrals if we if we deem it necessary, which really is more in line with how our, our town governance is supposed to operate anyway. Um, and it all, what that also would do is allow a very reasonable pathway for um, development that may be coming into town because this board will always have a quorum. You know, we're, we're the head of the government, we're the elected body. So it's not likely or, or really even possible um, that 
this board wouldn't be able to take action within a reasonable period of time. Whereas that board, as with many other civic functions, you can't find people to serve on it um, or, or you can't find qualified people to serve on it. And so I, I would suggest these um, modest revisions to you guys for your consideration and discussion. I, you know, I just have a, a question. I, I just, I remember when I was taking the, getting the approval to put the trail in for Melrose, the, the Melrose Park, I had to go through a number of hoops with deep and one of them was, I had to have the state archeologist out there and we, and he did a dig and decided what was going on. He mentioned to me, you know, he had asked, are you intending on tearing down those barns uh, you know, that are in the upper field where the, the cornfields are and stuff. And, you know, we, we were going around them, we weren't touching them. But, and, and I thought he said to me that if you're doing something with those, they need to be graded before you can do anything with them. Is, is this something that, that they have, do they have a state issue here too, or is it just us? No, but there is a statute. Hang on a second, I'll find it. Um, up to, up to ordinance. Um, it's 29406, um, which is the permit for demolition of a particular structure, exemptions and a waiting period. That's the statute that allows the ordinance to, to be operative. Um, and it talks about um, a maximum number of days that it can be delayed. And that's why you'll, you'll see in green, um, in green is Josh's edits. Um, so for no more than 180 days, he inserted it in there because that's the maximum delay allowable by the enabling statute. Um, so that's, that's, it's 29406 that speaks to the concern you have, but it's a, it's an enabling statute. It's left to the local discretion. Yeah, you I mean, not that it matters to our decision-making, but I, I just was curious if they had a state. Yeah. The other thing, you know, one of the things that, that Josh uh, inserted in here that I think, uh, as I read it, probably is inaccurate is the, um, the change from 15 days to 30 days. And that's because that's talking about a, a number of days from the publication of a notice, which also has to happen within a prescribed number of days. So if the intention here is to get it to work within 30 days, that really should remain 15 if you work through the rest of the ordinance. By leaving it at 30, it, it takes the waiting period as could be a maximum of 45 days um, without intervention from the selectman who may extend it further. So I would, I would actually seek to reject that edit, but accept the rest of it. Marie? Yeah, um, the only problem I have with it, I don't necessarily have a problem with what the change is going to be here, but going back to the Barbara Schmignall days and when this ordinance was brought out, it had to do with the fact that there was a house on um, Main Street and Warehouse Point um, that was scheduled for demolition and they hadn't had a chance yet to um, make a determination if the Historical Society wanted to get it because it was on the um, state historical registry, if I recall that conversation back then. Um, if we take this over, how are we going to know if something is is historically protected? So there is a requirement that there be a public notice uh, within a certain number of days. I think it's within 10 days of the building department getting the application for demolition that needs to be in a, a publication of record. And then yep. if there is uh, somebody who submits inquiry within a, a, also a fixed number of days, um, that triggers the additional review. If there okay. is no inquiry within a fixed number of days, the demolition can move forward. And that's existing in the ordinance. Right. Um, so the, the issue is the automatic referral to the historic commission um, who for, you know, at this point in time anyway, can't actually do anything. Right. Um, so it, it's that which causes an automatic 90 day delay, which could have adverse uh, effects on, on other things we have going on. And it's not because there's necessarily anything of historic import, simply that we don't have enough bodies to sit in the chairs to say there's nothing to see here. Right. And again, I come back to the, the uh, advisory capacity of the commission anyway, to the selectmen. I mean, I would just say, and I'll use the um, 
mill, mill site there in Broadbrook as an example. Far as I'm concerned, that building is of no value and should be taken down, my personal opinion. But I know on the flip side of that, historically wise, there's a difference of opinion. Yeah, we're gonna have a, a very robust discussion about that in our next meeting um, to include the, um, the folks from Raytheon. Um, I'll tell you, I shared that opinion um, and I, in the last three weeks I've toured it twice um, and I no longer share that perspective. There is part of the building is down uh, and, and is going to be continuing to come down. Um, but um, there is a there are some good bones there that really could be preserved, you know, if, if the appropriate circumstances lined up. So uh, I just suggest we, we um, kind of withhold judgment on that until we actually see some some photos and hear from the Raytheon folks about um, what they see is feasible and not. And um, Lee Hoffman will join us for that conversation as well. Um, not to get too far ahead of my skis, but one of the concerns about that that they've had is that they can't find a buyer for it. Um, and a buyer may be materializing. So, you know, the, the conversation should remain fluid until we talk with them. On the, on the ordinance, do we move this forward? Do you want to marinate on it? Do we want to, is this something you don't want to do? Where, where are you guys? You know, it's it's kind of a tough situation because I would like to have the you know there's some some uh, direction to a future board of selectmen that you need to you know put the uh, you know you need to get input from the historical commission uh, and obviously that that would do us no good at this point in time anyway. But I mean there are uh, there are I'm sure scenarios where. You would want to, you know, to know something. And I know with Mar Barbara, for, it's talking specifically about Marie's um, point of that, that, the example that she made. Like, it's not necessarily that they want to like block that from happening, but they may want to uh, remove or, you know, or work to, you know, to negotiate the removal of a certain specific thing in there that that you know has some value historically, you know. Um, so. You know, in the case of a barn, you know, they may want to be able to reclaim the wood or take it down and put it up somewhere else, you know, theoretically, uh, you know, so like there should be some sort of historical review and we should, it should not just be the Board of Selectmen, because I think that, you know, the Board of Selectmen may, could just be only thinking of the business aspect of it, you know, and, and, and you need to take into account, you know, at least get a, a grade on, you know, is, you know, sure it's old. But does it have actual value, you know, um, and and should we be recognized that in some way? Is it unique? Is it the last one? You know, we kind of need to figure out that, and it doesn't have to take ninety days. You can see before, you know, maybe ninety days seems reasonable, but things move a lot quicker now, and I don't I don't think it needs to be ninety days. So I'm I'm for shortening it up, but I still think we need to put some sort of ask to some historic. If it's not our commission, somebody that would some sort of knowledge in the subject. And, and our historical commission may or may not have that knowledge, really. I'm not sure how you handle that. And I don't want to tie it up forever, but I don't think we should abandon some sort of look at the historical value of things. So you want to take a shot at rewrite, rewriting it? <laughs> <laughs> not on the spot. <laughs> no, no, no. But you got, you know, a week and a half or so. Okay. Yeah, I could Toss it around a little. That'd be great. Everybody good with Alan taking a shot at that? Yeah, I agree with Alan fully. Um, I mean, even if it just, and I, again, to his point, I mean, you could make it, you could write it so that it says one member of the historical commission, but then you don't know if that one member is going to do the proper research and, and get the real facts on the proposed, you know, demolition property. So, yeah, but uh, yeah, I agree with Alan. It's it somewhere it needs to get some type of historical review by someone who knows. 
and I don't think the Board of Selectmen is really that board. Our historical commission may not be. They may not have that expertise. It may at some point in time. It always depends on who's there, you know. And you know, right now, they may not even have that expertise. And, and you I can't agree. even use you can't even use Shippo uh, because you can't guarantee that they would turn it around in any any fixed amount of time. And that's the other problem with using an out, any kind of on you know outside consultant. Uh, you know, I guess you would. I mean due diligence if you say hey state come in and take a look at this and they say well we'll get to you in you know four months it's all right well sorry forget it you know it's it's over you know i mean we need to recognize the fact that we can't just be letting things you know fester for a long time because you know the bureaucracy yeah i mean maybe it's maybe it's as simple as um uh revisiting the expiration period you know maybe it's not you know, 90 days, but 45 days and keep everything else status quo. You know, I mean, I, I just, it seems like we're, we're building in a, a 90 day log jam of our own making. I'm just, I'm trying to fig figure out how to unjam that. No, I agree. It's too long. And I also agree that the board of selectmen should make the final decision. They should, they should get a recommendation from the historical commission uh, if that's available, if they can and and use that in, in their decision so if we got that recommendation and you know that's part of our decision making process and we can reject it or accept it you know but we we should at least that information should be brought forward and debated publicly you know so the commission the the board of selectmen shall get an opinion from the historic preservation commission within 45 days if if, if available i don't know Something if they like are that. able to do so, yeah, something like that. All right. So, or do we Alan's got some homework. Damn it. Okay, you go the opposite way and just say that once the notice is produced, the Historical Society has excess amount of days to report to the Board of Selectmen if there's an issue. All right. Well, We'll, we'll circulate this amongst us. Is that is that legal? We can do that? Yeah, okay. two of you can. All right, um, where are we now? We did that, we did that, we did that. Selectman's reports, right? So, um, mine is brief-ish. Um, so beginning this week, town facilities have reopened to the public for normal business activities, uh, except for the senior center, which will reopen for normal indoor activities beginning on June 1st. Um, the town will be adhering to the guidelines issued by CDC and Governor Lamont's latest executive orders, which is that anyone who's fully vaccinated can come into municipal facilities unrestricted. Anyone who's not fully vaccinated will still be required to wear a mask while indoors. Um, I, as I'm sure you all were, I was delighted to see the outcome of the referendum last week, which saw the passage of, of all three questions. Um, and I'll spare you guys the, the details of those because you're all well familiar with them. Um, on May 11th, I met with the new, lead, uh, new board leadership at the Connecticut Trolley Museum. The museum has been a staple in East Windsor since the 1940s, and they do have a newly invigorated uh, board of directors who have some really awesome ideas for making the museum an even more impressive regional destination. Um, we discussed opportunities to seek additional state funding, as well as the new American Rescue Plan funding program that the town will be offering. On May 12th, I was pleased to visit with the uh, folks at Lincoln Technical Institute who are celebrating their 75th anniversary and have educated more than a quarter of a million students across the, the company's history. The school's leadership were kind enough to welcome my staff and me and to provide us with uh, a really awesome and hands-on tour of the programs that they offer. Um, that same day, I was happy to join ISO New England as a panelist to discuss the municipal perspective regarding the siting process for grid scale solar projects. It was a great opportunity to share some best practices as well as both good and bad experiences uh, with leaders who are going to be working in, the, in this new and emerging technology for quite some time. Uh, other panelists on that uh, panel included representatives from the Siting Council, from DEEP, and from environmental advocacy groups. 
On the 13th, I met with the president and CEO of Specialty Printing at their facilities in the industrial park. Specialty Printing started in a barn in Ellington and now has more than 200 employees. Um, they work closely with USDA, with the US Postal Service, with Johnson & Johnson, and many household products. Um, if you have food in your home, you have something that was made right here in East Windsor, uh, and it came right out of that facility. Um, next week, DECD Commissioner Lehman and I will be visiting with them again to discuss uh, um, expansion opportunities, and I'm really excited about that. On the 14th, I testified, as I said, I testified in front of the legislature um, asking for the state to consider conveying the Solent North facility to the town of East Windsor, as well as asking them to lift low income restrictions on homes on South and Phelps Road, um, which is a problem that has lingered for many, many years and that we're getting closer to solving. Um, lifting the restriction is a significant step towards granting relief to those homeowners who own those homes um, and something that I'm, I'm hopeful will happen uh, within the next few weeks. We're winding down the town's vaccination clinics shortly. Today, we partnered again with Southern Auto Auction, Priority Urgent Care, and USDA to do a joint Farmers to Families Fresh Food Box distribution event at a Johnson & Johnson vaccine clinic. Um, I wanna thank and recognize Deputy First Selectman D'Souza, who I believe has been at every one of those Fresh Food Box distribution events. Um, our final town-sponsored clinic uh, for vaccine administration will be tomorrow, and it'll be held at Mill Pond Village from 8.30 to 4.00. Walk-ins are welcomed. This Saturday, the Warehouse Point Library will be holding a book fair from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. to benefit and showcase the library. Um, so stop on down and add to your summer reading list. On June 1st, the town will be sponsoring an economic development forum in partnership with Advanced CT that will look into tools and strategies available to our community to encourage small scale and large scale economic development. Um, that discussion will be held via Zoom. And lastly, we're excited to announce that the East Windsor Summer Concert Series, as we talked about earlier, will begin on June 10th um, and will be from 6.30 to 8 at the town park. We're very excited to showcase the new band shell that's there and to um, get back to some good in-person community events. So th that's my update. I'd recognize the Deputy First Selectman. Yeah, Jay, I have nothing to report tonight. I only had one meeting and it was last night and it was repetitive um, of the information that I have given to the board previously. So I don't have anything today. Okie doke. Uh, Charlie. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> she caught me off guard. Okay. Right. On May 10th, I attended the special presentation given by the East Windsor Police Department to the Diversity Council. Uh, the police presented testimony on how they handle situations, uh, train officers, their progress on becoming an accredited police department, and where they stand in regards to complying with the new police accountability bill. Uh, they also discussed their future plans and techniques and ways in which they will improve the department's handling of racial, social, and sexual orientation issues. Uh, the presentation was very informative and I thought displayed how diverse and advanced our town's police department already is. I wish the meeting had been better attended, and I look forward to seeing our police grow and adapt with all the goals that they have set for themselves. On May 11th, um, the town budget referendum um, was held and all the uh, budget and questions passed, as Jason mentioned. On May 12th, I attended the police commissioner's meeting. Uh, several complaints about speeding on Depot Street and Reservoir um, Ave were brought up to their attention and the department will be taking action on this and monitoring both roads with more frequency. Uh, on May 13th, I attended the last PTO meeting of the year. Uh, despite all the COVID restrictions, um, we still managed to raise money and hold fundraisers that support both the Broadbrook Elementary School and the East Windsor Middle School. Um, we're still looking for members if anyone is interested for next year. And that's my report. Thank you, sir. Selectman Baker. And I have no report for you this evening. So I yield back the balance of my time to Selectman Muska. Thank you, sir. Selectman Muska. Okay, on May 10th, I also attended that Diversity Council special meeting in conjunction with the East Windsor Police Department. Charlie went into detail on that, um, so I don't need to. Um, I feel that our police department is always proactive and always looking ahead, and I commend them for their work. 
in honor of National Police Week, it was my pleasure to go on a ride along with Officer Zachary Sherman on Sunday. Officer Sherman has been with the East Windsor Police Department for nearly six years. He is a valuable member of our patrol division and he answered all of my questions and educated me on domestic violence protocol. This is my third ride along with the department and I encourage anyone who is interested in understanding the life of a police officer to contact the police department to make an appointment to go on a ride along. Um, Jason and Charlie already talked about the budget. Um, on May 12th, I attended the Board of Education meeting held via Zoom. Broadbrook Elementary School Principal Laura Fox gave a presentation on ACES Day, which was held on May 11th, and Field Day will be June 4th. A curriculum report was given on the SATs. The official last day of school will be June 15th, and graduation day is June 16th. On May 13th, the Veterans Commission met at the American Legion Post 40. Much discussion revolved around the planning and execution of the Memorial Day Parade, which is a go this year, and will leave from the Town Hall Annex promptly at 10 a.m. The veterans are considering holding another paver fundraiser for the Memorial Green, and will be selling poppies Memorial Day weekend at Geisler's. Boy Scout Troop 89 will be assisting with the distribution of flags on veterans graves at St. Catherine Cemetery beginning this evening. The commission is hoping to make a decision on holding their race this year um, by the next meeting so they can begin planning. Um, on May 19th, the Board of Finance held their regular meeting. The Board of Finance will be putting in a request to have a joint meeting with the Board of Education to discuss some discrepancies within reports and to get on the same page when it comes to finances. Um, it was cutting out a little bit on Amy's audio, but I believe $300,000 of real estate taxes are still owed to the town. 260,000 um, are from Walmart. And many departments, um, and including town clerk and police department, I didn't hear all of them with the audio, um, have met their revenue budgets for this uh, fiscal year. The Trolley Museum begins their summer music series tomorrow night with Just Genie. Tickets are $10 and can be purchased at ct-trolley.org. The East Windsor Garden Club will be hosting their plant and yard sale this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at 235 Rye Street. And there's just lots of exciting things happening in town. And now that the weather's nice, I hope that everyone will get out and enjoy. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, public participation. Is the public second opportunity to address members of the board or uh, items that you think ought to be uh, on our radar screen? So are there, Mr. Leach. Name and address, please. Bob Leach, 39 Church Street. Um, I just wanted to clarify that the, um, the Board of Selectmen's approval of alcohol on town properties, um, Scout Hall is a, is a leased property, but it, but it resides on town property. And I would imagine that would include that facility. Was that, would that be correct? So without the benefit of reviewing the lease and shooting from the hip, um, I would, my guess would be that the building is under the control of the, um, uh, of Scout Hall. The grounds would be under the control, whatever, whatever's not covered in the lease would be under the control of the town. So for example, if, um, you know, the, the fire department wanted to do their beer garden on one of the soccer fields, the board of selectmen would likely have jurisdiction over that is my guess. Um, but if there was somebody who wanted to do a wine tasting inside Scout Hall, I don't believe we would have jurisdiction over that, but that would fall to the Scout Hall Committee. I'm guessing. Okay, and it's, it's always been considered since it's on town property that uh, no alcohol was allowed. So anyway, um, I guess we'll review that and, uh, and move forward from there. Thanks. Some of the, um, some of the members of the Scout Hall Advisory Committee or whatever their, the name of the management organization is have actually asked that, that at some point in time the lease be reviewed anyway. So that could be a discussion point at that point in time. Okay. Um, I also have a, a message that Joe has his hand raised. Joe, if you give your, your name and your address, please. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, Joe Malinfant, 4 South Road. Uh, first first of all, uh, Jason, you and the board, I want to thank you for everything you're doing for us over here. 
This place has been known for years as a twilight zone and hopefully that'll come to an end. Uh, second of all, I do have a question on the sewer reline. Uh, you had mentioned that they got to replace 100 feet of sewer. Is this through the yards or is, uh, my concern is, do we need to move stuff? We don't know exactly where they're digging or where they're lining. So if we have to move stuff out of our yard or around our yard so that they have room to work. Um, so Joe, I have your email, right? Yes. Um, I'm going to ask Len Norton to get in touch with you directly uh, and provide you with that uh, answer. I don't want to, I don't want to tell you something that's not accurate. Um, mm -hmm. I'll ask him to get in touch with you uh, tomorrow or Monday. Okay, I appreciate that. And again, I want to thank everybody for the work that you're putting into, like I say, to get try and get us out of the twilight zone. We're making good progress, man. I'm I'm pretty optimistic, but you know, the, you never know what's coming next. Um, yeah, things things seem to be lining up in a good way, though. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, well, I'll have Len be in touch. Thank you. There's no other public participation. Um, we will have a really brief executive session and then call it a night. Um, there will be there will be no action afterwards. Um, so Peg, you, you won't need to dial back in for anything other than the adjournment time. So could I have a motion to go into, an ex into executive session? Make a motion to go into executive session by Marie D'Souza at 9 0 1 p.m. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, Selectman D'Souza? Aye. Selectman Baker? Aye. Selectman Nordell? Aye. Selectman Muska? Aye. Okay, we're in executive session at 9.02. Everybody have a good night. Thank you very much. We're out of executive session at 9.16. Uh, is there any further business to come before the board? Selectman Nordell will move to adjourn our regular meeting at 9.16 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Close. <laughs> uh, the motion has been made and seconded. It's non-debatable. Uh, Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. We are adjourned at 9.16 p.m.